Hi, Sarah Childress back with you, and I wanted to share an experience that I had last night at the Belcourt Theater here in Nashville, Tennessee, which was seeing Jordan Peele's new film, Nope. And I wanted to start with my theatrical experience, or maybe I should say my post-theatrical or post-screening theatrical experience, when I ran into a group of folks who were completely overwhelmed by the film, and I thought, what an amazing way to be, what an, uh, an amazingly productive place to be in that feeling of being overwhelmed. Because do you remember when we used to go to films to be overwhelmed, to be awe inspired, to be swept away by or immersed within these incredibly spectacular images, these, these spectacles, cinematic spectacles in the, in the largest sense of the word? Because I feel like Jordan Peele actually wants us to be mindful of spectacle. And in fact, he starts the film with a quote that puts us right in that territory. And the quote is, I will cast abominable filth on you, make you vile, make you a spectacle. And this quote is intercut with glimpses of a stage set where we have a chimpanzee actor who's gone on, and I hate to say it this way, but he's kind of gone on a killing spree. And this is not a spoiler. It happens like at the very, very first part of the film. But I did want to bring it up because the, that particular moment is it kind of threads its way through the film and one and it's an important it's an important thematic moment and in fact one one of my friends said like so what's up with the chimpanzee so i wanted to mention it because i feel like it will help you kind of decipher some of what's going on in the film but anyway so we have that quote intercut with images of gordy that's the chimpanzee's name as he's kind of, shall we say, rediscovering his power, more on that in a second, on the stage set. But that's intercut with the opening title. So yeah, it's quite early on in the film. And one of those titles includes Jordan Peele's production company, which is Monkey's Paw. Now, I believe that he was naming, he named his production company Mon Monkey Paw Productions off of the 1902 short story, The Monkey's Paw. And uh, in case you don't remember that, it's essentially the story um, that, centering around anyone who has this monkey's paw will receive three wishes, but will do so at great cost because of the sort of the human hubris of intervening in fate. So he or she who intervenes in fate will find their own just punishment. But one of the things that the story does is it kind of elides and erases the monkey of the monkey's paw, who actually made perhaps the greatest sacrifice of all and like, I'm not even going to say giving up in having being murdered and having his paw or her paw forcibly removed. So if we think about this great originary price that has been paid by the monkey, which is then subsequently disappeared within the story, we can think about the monkey's present absence as a way of getting into something that I feel like Peel is also getting into, which is exploitation and how exploitation both erases kind of identity and community, but also erases the, the individual. And so that's why I would love to start with thinking about spectacle, um, but also the ways that Peel parses spectacle into two types. So the first type is one that I've already mentioned, which is the cinematic spectacle. And the cool thing is that Peel has made really an old school cinematic spectacle. I mean, he shot the film on 65 millimeter Panavision and IMAX, which are two of our largest film formats. And and, and this is so cool because Panavision, for those of you who don't know, uh, was created in the 50s as a response to television uh, in order to compete with TV and to create even wider screen, like big, big, big spectacular images that just could not be replicated on TV as a way to draw people back into theaters and out of their homes and out of their TVs. So that's where Panavision CinemaScope come from. And so in that particular moment in the 50s when there was a concern that, oh no, films are dead, it kind of echoes our current moment when films are really seen as streaming content, less so than events or community creators. And so I feel like Peel is kind of intervening in that conversation by kind of kicking it old school. And also you'll notice uh, in the film that OJ wears a Panavision logoed hoodie, which by the way is very close in color to this, which is why I'm back in this orange shirt. So keep an eye out for that. Also important plot points in the film involve sort of analog or film rather than digital image making, 
And that becomes an important kind of differentiation with the preference being given to film image making. So watch out for that. And also Peel's very skillful mixing of genres, cultural references, and also cultural critique really makes this a film that's both widely appealing as well as intellectually productive. So you could just go to the film and enjoy it and have a blast, or you can study it and really think about it. It's richly rewarding in both senses. And on that note, there's a lot of really cool kind of Easter egg moments in it and cinematic references. And I'll let you pick out <laughs> your favorites, but I wanted to share a kind of an esoteric one that shows up again pretty early on in the film just to kind of give you a sense of that. And that's when we see, um, we have a brief glimpse of Otis Haywood Sr., who is OJ and Emerald's father. We get a glimpse of him and let's just say there is a reference to, I think, Luis Bunuel's Un Chien Andalou, the start of that film. <laughs> so I'll invite you to see if you can find that one too. But moving on, so that's kind of the first form of spectacle that I see Peel working with. The second form of spectacle is the one that he involves um, in the text that he uses, or the one that he, in, you know, uh, like evokes, that's what I was looking for, in the quote that he uses. And that's the form of spectacle that involves exploitation. It's the turning of another entity into a spectacle, something that establishes um, them as, or, or transforms them into vile and, and filthy, because what it does is it subordinates them. It creates a very hierarchical power dynamic. And what we see throughout the film is what I like to think of as a revenge of the spectacularized. And that's where Gordy the chimpanzee fits in. He's the trained monkey. And so I'm using that loaded language intentionally to tap into the racism, the racial violence, and the exploitation that that phrase encapsulates, because I think it's very meaningfully used and invoked within the film. Uh, and, and the powerful thing is that this trained monkey kills. And so it's a reminder that those who are domesticated or humbled and disempowered may to forget their power, may remember and rediscover their power and exercise it. Uh, and in this turn, the prey actually can become predators. And so we see this, this flip when the, when the prey become predators, whenever humans are at their most hubristic, their most arrogant. So for example, in, in Gordy's situation, uh, the, the kind of trigger is a, a birthday party for him on the TV series that he's a part of. So it's a chimp's birthday party. And what that does is it erases the, the chimp's unique identity and sense of community, but the context for the party really is to serve as a forum to test and reaffirm the power dynamic among the humans that are assembled for the party. So yeah, I know it, it does sound kind of Planet of the Apes, but here the exploitation dynamic is very present. It's not just past, it's present. But there's also what seems to be a hopeful moment within these, these series of events that take place around Gordy's um, flip from, predator to, or from prey to predator. And within the carnage, there's a moment, and I don't want to go into too much detail so you can discover it for yourself, when one of the actors kind of humbles himself with, um, before Gordy. And so one of the actors who is uh, within the, the TV series that's referenced and who also is one of the main characters in the film, he humbles himself in front of Gordy the chimpanzee. And there's kind of a moment of mutual recognition, a moment of like community and parody that seems about to happen. And there's even kind of an echo or reference to Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam. But just before that moment of parody and community can happen, it's destroyed. And that possibility becomes incomplete and unfulfilled. So let's fast forward 20 or 30 years probably 30, I keep dropping decades the older I get. But anyway, we see Ricky Jupe Park, who's one of the, the main characters in the film, in his theme park, and the theme park is called Star Lasso. And the aptly named Park makes his living from spectacle. And he's created this artificial Old West town, which is Star Lasso, and we think it's an Old West um, sort of theme park, 
until we see that it's fundamentally founded on exploitation and lassoing the starship, whether you want to call UFO or UAF, that's terrorizing the area. Now, again, this isn't a spoiler because if you've seen the trailer to Nope or read anything about Nope, you know that there are ETs in this film. So I'm not, <laughs> not telling you anything that's not readily available. I really want to avoid spoilers here. But essentially, Park has the audacity, and again, it's in the name, Star Lasso, to think that he can turn the ETs into, for lack of a better word, trained monkeys. And so he packages them to serve his purpose and become a spectacle for sale. But it's also important to remember that Park himself sells himself as a spectacle. So in a way he's kind of doing unto others. So we see that there's an institution that kind of thrives on this kind of spectacularization. Capitalism? I don't know. I'll let you decide for yourself. Um, plus, Park believes or wants to believe that he has a relationship with the ETs, and I'll leave you to discover what happened based on this, this kind of interaction. But I think the important point uh, is that regarding these two kind of parsings of, spectac of spectacle and spectacularization is that each of the spectacles produces very different results. So if you think about film as spectacle, that spectacle creates a community, whether you're bringing together a variety of different people to create the film or a variety of different people to watch and experience the film, it really is a coming together of equals to create a shared and creative experience. Now, I know I'm making it a little bit Pollyanna-ish because we know that generally there is a hierarchy, <laughs> at least within the film industry. But let's just think about this in a very, um, a very happy way where it's a shared experience coming together around a, you know, a creative event, both for makers and for, for viewers. Um, but the other spectacle, that transformation of individuals into spectacle, actually destroys community and identity and individuality and makes the spectacularized, again, the vile and filthy, the demeaned and the destroyed. Until, because Peel's not going to leave us in, in complete dark and, and hopelessness, because here's where the eyes have it, and the eyes are a very important motif within the film. Um, the main characters, the brother OJ and sister Emerald, they're really the ones who draw our attention to the importance of eyes. And eyes, of course, are the organs of sight, what we use to watch films. They're also the windows to the soul, and they're the way to build relationship and community. When you think about eyes sort of meeting across the room or, or just eyes locked in mutual acknowledgement and recognition. So it's so cool to me because it's been a long time since I've seen a film that deals so directly with the dynamics of the gaze. And here again, we have two forms of eye interaction. We have averting the eyes and the sort of eye to eye gaze that, that both um, figure quite prominently within the film. And so the eye to eye gaze takes two forms. One is it can be seen as a challenge, but it can also be seen as a way to recognize and acknowledge. And that's, why, that's where averting the eyes becomes important when we think about like eye to eye as a challenge. So averting the eyes then is no longer like participating in that kind of challenge. And so if we think about US history uh, and US racial history, past and present, but really just US history in general, black Americans were often forced to avert their eyes in the presence of white Americans because to look at a white American was seen as a form of challenge. So in white supremacist societies, the aversion of the or the averting of the eyes was seen as a way to maintain kind of the social status quo. And it was um, a, a way of forcing black Americans to perform in their lived experience, in their daily lives, a form of subordinates. Now, within that performance of subordinates, black Americans also protected, nurtured, and honored their unique cultures and communities. And so this eye-to-eye -eye recognition becomes a way not only to reinforce that sense of community, identity, and relationship, especially when it's under threat and under duress and under pressure, as it was and still is today, it also brings to light the richness, the resourcefulness, and the power that had been hidden away. And I feel like that's something that this film really does, especially in the character of OJ, but certainly OJ and Emerald together because they both have their turn in that particular kind of powerful dynamic.
And this bringing to light also manifests in the title cards that you're going to see. So each title is the name of an animal. And to be, and the, and the animal is named and individualized. And in this way, I feel like that's also a form of recognition and acknowledgement and one that extends beyond the human world to kind of bridge the divide between human and, 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 and natural and animals and nature to show our interrelationship you know, the human nature interrelationship. And the other cool thing is it also extends beyond our world. So I'm not gonna say any more than that. I think I've given, <laughs> I think I've given you plenty to chew on. So if, I, if you've seen the film, I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't seen the film yet, I hope this will convince you to go and take a look because it's really, it's fantastic. And it's honestly one of my favorite films of this year. See you next time.